Well, hello, everyone, and welcome. Um, while we give everybody a moment to join, uh, why don't you open up the chat and let us know where you're uh, joining us from? More than 200 participants so far. Where are you all from? Let us know in the chat. Rochester, New York, Brantford, Connecticut. I think we're going to hear about Braddock Bay a little bit today over near Rochester. Kathleen, Georgia, Woodstock, New York, Brooklyn. Oppinger's Falls, Liverpool, New York. I used to live in Liverpool. Allentown, Maine, Wisconsin. Great. Well, welcome everyone. My name is Rich Merritt and I'll be your host today. This webinar is brought to you by the Audubon State Offices of Connecticut, New York, whose mission it is to protect birds in the places we all need, in our forests, on our coasts, and across local communities. A quick reminder that this webinar is being recorded and will soon be available on our YouTube and Facebook pages. Um, questions are welcome in the chat box at any time, and we will have time at the end for question and answers. Um, today's webinar is on the wonderful world of raptors, and it's being presented by my friend, Ryan McLean, the bird education specialist at the Greenwich Audubon Center, where he has been the official hawk counter for Quake, um, Quaker Ridge Hawk Watch for six seasons and has also counted hawks professionally at the Braddock Bay Spring Hawk Watch in Rochester, New York. We'll hear a little bit more about that um, place shortly. Uh, Ryan's also an amazing musician, which adds great value to our annual staff retreats. Um, and with that, I thank you for joining our webinar and hand things over to our presenter, Ryan McLean. Thank you so much, Rich, and good afternoon, everyone. And thank you all so much for being with us today. It's a pleasure to be with you all as we kick off and celebrate one of not only my favorite times of migration season, but I know for many of us who are watching here too. For those of you who I have not had the pleasure of meeting, um, once again, my name is Ryan McLean and I'm the bird education specialist here at the Greenwich Audubon Center in Greenwich, Connecticut. And we are the oldest Audubon nature education center in the country having opened in 1943, where not only do we provide with our over 300 acres of habitat for birds and wildlife, an opportunity to come and hike our trails and enjoy them, which people are welcome to come and do if you're in the area, but also providing an opportunity to educate the public on the importance of all the creatures that this habitat provides a home for. And it's not just creatures that live in this home, it's areas that we can observe and monitor birds and other species that are migrating, that are going from one location to probably even another continent. And birds of prey are one of the most captivating members of the bird family and the bird world. But there's a lot that is interesting for people to discover about them. I got my introduction to watching hawks here at our Audubon Center site at our Quaker Ridge Hawk Watch at a very young age and was captivated by being able to go to a location where individuals were there to show people the birds that were migrating over our heads and to help us to understand why they are migrating and the important work that we do. Our Quaker Ridge Hawk Watch has now um, kept records of migrating hawks, eagles, falcons, and vultures for now just about 50 years. We're celebrating a major milestone since the very first hawk count reports from here. And now as we welcome new generations to come enjoy and be a part of this incredible community science effort, there is now people do I see getting that same appreciation and love for this incredible phenomenon that's happening in nature. We hear a lot of different things when people first discover our hawk watching site. One thing that often will be said or exclaimed when we see people arrive is, gee, I didn't know that birds of prey migrate. We think of small birds migrating or skeins of Canada geese in the fall, but we don't think of our raptors or birds of prey very often as the same kind of journey birds that these other ones that we associate with us coming through on these journeys. But there are some clues that indicate that to us, and it is very much the reason why we use raptors as an indicator at the top of the food chain to help us understand what's happening below them in our ecosystems. Now, the first clue we can get as to why these birds migrate, if we look at what we like to call the hawk menu here, is that although these birds are raptors by nature because of the way they catch their prey, utilizing their sharp talons on their feet, they like different menu items. Some birds like our familiar red-tailed hawk are largely rodent and small mammal specialists, which are here year round. So some of those red-tailed hawks don't migrate and they stay even through the winter. But if we look at the menu items for a species like smaller sharp-shinned hawk, 
we see that they predominantly like to hunt small birds, which are migrating at this time of year. So in, in sense, they have to follow their food so that they can have that to survive the winter. And other species, like at the top, if we see the menu for broad winged hawk, that menu consists of insects and, sorry, folks, insects, reptiles, and amphibians are on that hawk's menu, which you're not going to find here in the Northeast when it's cold and there's snow on the ground. So that species will have to stage a migration all the way to the rainforests of South America and is a species that we're getting particularly excited for at this point in the hawk migration season. Now, hawk watching and our realization as to why this was happening had sad beginnings, but helped us to understand what we could do to help these birds. As many of you know, of course, in 1918, the Migratory Bird Treaty Act was passed, protecting all of our North American bird species and making it a crime to cause any harm and kill any of them. But there were exceptions to this law, particularly in certain states. During the early 1900s, raptors were largely still considered vermin. The phrase chicken hawk is probably very familiar for people who thought these birds were just out to get livestock and chickens. And some state governments even placed bounties on hawks. The Pennsylvania Game Commission placed a $5 bounty on any hawk shot. So people would take rifles and go up to the tops of mountains like Hawk Mountain, Pennsylvania, where this very sad photo of a large field of hawks that were shot was taken by Richard Poe. Thankfully, that got into the hands of individuals who wanted to do something about that. It got into the hands of Rosalie Edge, one of the most profoundly influential female environmentalists to this day, who was at the time a member, large part of the New York suffragette movement, but also an extremely passionate environmentalist who saw these photos and in her outrage decided to go to Hawk Mountain herself, purchased the property, turned it into Hawk Mountain Sanctuary, hired its very first wardens, Maurice and Irma Brun, to prevent hunters from going there. And in doing so, realized that the reason that all of these hawks were heading past this ridgeline was because they were using it as a highway in the sky for migration. And instead of shooting these birds, we can use it as an op opportunity not only to enjoy this spectacle, but to get extremely important information on these birds by observing and counting them in their migration. It didn't take long in the subsequent decades for people to wonder if there were other sites just like Hawk Mountain. Where were these birds coming from? They had to come from New England and from maybe upstate New York and from Canada to get down through Pennsylvania. So in the 1970s, also 50 years ago, celebrating a 50th anniversary this season, individuals in Connecticut came together to test out a bunch of different sites including our site here at the Greenwich Audubon Center, see if there were locations where people could see this similar phenomenon to what they would see at Hawk Mountain. This was the formation of the New England Hawk Watch Association, now called Northeast Hawk Watch, which to this day is a unit of volunteer observers and people involved with all of our Hawk Watches who can help assess these numbers of birds migrating past different sites. But it's not just in New England and the Northeast United States this is occurring. Raptors are utilizing all the flyways across our countries to get from one location to the next. And with this in mind, there really needed to be a centralized effort to compile information and assess data on how we can see how raptor populations are doing by counting them in migration. This was the formation of the Hawk Migration Association of North America which is the organization that we submit all of our hawk watch numbers every day and every year to, along with the majority of other hawk watches in the country. And that goes to all the researchers that are putting together this analytical data of raptor populations that are in decline, populations that are on the rebound. And because they're at the top of the food chain, seeing how this information can help us learn about our ecosystems and their health as a whole. So in order to observe these birds migrating. We just mentioned where we submit this data to, but then the part where us on the ground looking for these birds comes in. And to look and observe for migrating raptors, we have to keep a few things in mind about how they travel, the tools they use for travel, and the best conditions to see these birds in. Now, some birds will just flap a long distance across the water to get all the way to their wintering grounds. It's amazing to think a ruby-throated hummingbird being about the size of my thumb will fly over the Gulf of Mexico in one night to get down to Costa Rica for the winter. Raptors, on the other hand, they like to use a few alternate, alternative sources of energy. 
in a sense, a bit lazier because they don't want to flap as much, but they have incredible tricks up their sleeve. For one, we mentioned mountain ridges like Hawk Mountain along the Appalachians in Pennsylvania. They have one special trick where they're able to utilize wind updrafts that come up off a mountain ridge. When wind hits a mountain ridge, it deflects upward, giving them more or less a magic carpet ride to coast along on. If they have a north wind at their back and that updraft underneath them, it gives them something to propel them farther south along for hundreds of miles. If they don't have ridges in front of them, they can also utilize hot air bubbles that are formed when sun hits pavement or large open spaces, which is called a thermal. And one of the most impressive sights to see in hawk watching is a group of maybe hundreds of hawks at a time utilizing a thermal to gain altitude, swirling in it like boiling water, which is why we like to call them a kettle of hawks until they reach a boiling point and they will glide outwards. It's oftentimes this behavior in these birds that we're looking for when we're looking for birds to count and which ones not to count. We very frequently will get a question, how do you know you're not counting the same bird twice? There's a lot of local raptors that live in our area. How do we know it's one that's not just living there? We know what some of our local species are and the ones that are staying all year long, like some of our red-tailed hawks, but we're also looking for that behavior and the direction they're going in. We know that these birds in the autumn are heading south, so we want to see them utilizing that way of gaining altitude and then gliding out in a southerly direction to get to a destination that we know is going to be much farther away. So when we see that behavior in certain species, we know that they're making the checklist for the day. If we see one heading north or if we see one that looks like it's just hunting, that bird will probably not get counted. And when we look for these birds and we think about what days we might see them, many people also ask, what's the best time of day to go hawk watching? And that is a, can be a complicated question to answer because any time of day when the sun is out could be good for migrating raptors to be moving, but the best days to see them, the best conditions to see them often very heavily involve the right weather conditions to see large quantities of migrating raptors. They're gonna need that energy from the sun to get thermals and altitude, but if they don't have the right wind to push them down into our area, we're probably not going to see as large of a quantity of these birds. Now, we mentioned that these birds like to use these thermals and elements the sun gives them, so they won't want to fly in the rain. And if a cold front is passing through with a lot of heavy rain, and wind, and clouds with it, they're going to settle down to rest and not migrate until that system passes through. But it will hold all of them back so that once that front is cleared and we have cooler weather, they're going to want to get going right away. And with northerly winds pushing them southward, that provides us an opportunity to have them come down into our region. For our location here in Greenwich, we generally like to look for northwest winds, generally around 10 to 15 miles an hour, because the northerly wind pushes them down to our area. The westerly component pushes them away from the mountain ridges to our west, like the Appalachians, to sort of more or less bottleneck them into our region. Another thing that very much helps is having some puffy clouds to help you spot the silhouettes of these birds against. Because if you have a plain blue sky and these birds are getting to sometimes thousands of feet using thermals, they can be very specky and hard to see. You can see a black dot against a cloud a lot more easily, though. Now at our hawk watch site here at Quaker Ridge, it's been determined that this is an adequate site to get large quantities of migrating birds, thus a good census of them, because we have some of these components working together. We're at the very bottom of ridges that are extending down through Massachusetts and Connecticut, and we are actually the highest elevation point in the town of Greenwich at about 510 feet above sea level. But once you pass that ridge of us, elevation drops very quickly and then Long Island Sound is right in front of all those birds that are coming, which is more or less them hitting a wall. You can't get ridge lift or thermals over any large body of water, so they need to pump the brakes, figure out the next direction they're going to go in. So because of this temporary buildup of traffic where birds have to sort of get off the interstate exit and find the next one to get onto, there's that temporary stall where air traffic will build up of these migrating birds. So for here, as I mentioned, we generally like to look for days of northwest winds, about 10 miles an hour, not too strong because then they get blown right to the water and need to work their way back. But 
If you watch the weather forecast, look for days of partly cloudy skies, northwest winds around 10 miles an hour, especially in the coming weeks. And so it is within that time frame from now, starting at the end of August, now through the end of November, we have an official hawk watcher on site every day, weather depending, and Audubon has hired an official hawk watcher since 1985 to be out here on weekdays with volunteers on weekends, but the public is welcome to come out any day they want to help assist in counting the hawks and looking for them. You don't have to always know what you're looking at, just helping to spot the birds is enough for you to be helping to contribute to community science. But it is a very fun and interesting process to start learning how to tell this alphabet of hawk shapes apart. As I mentioned, when we're seeing these birds fly over, they're often very much small black dots. We just have to see their silhouettes as opposed to colors that we might see on a perched bird or knowing what a bird is by hearing it sing. It's an alphabet of different shapes from the different raptor families that we have migrating over us. But unlike alphabet shapes, these are letters that will move and change direction. One species will be able to alter its wing shape to be able to fly in different ways. If you look at the diagram on the right, you can see different wing positions that maybe even one species of hawk can have. We often will think of hawks in a soaring position when they're holding their wings out and stretching them out to get circular motion, to circle upwards in a thermal to get altitude or to look down below them to search for food. But then if they're propelling themselves in one direction, they're gonna tuck their wings back in a glide where if you see that middle silhouette on the right, what looks like the wings now having hunched forward shoulders as a bird propels itself forward instead of circling. So that one species can shape shift on a dime to look completely different than what you saw before. So it's knowing the overall shape of one of these bird species, but also knowing the different lengths of tail, shape of the wing, length of the wing, length of the head from the body, to start telling these nearly a dozen, if not 15 or 16 different species apart that we will count here at our Hawk Watch sites. So the best thing to do is start breaking it down family by family before we start to assess what species it is. When we think of a very typical and memorable hawk shape of a soaring bird, we're often think of, thinking of long rectangular wings, and splayed out tail, is their typical characteristics of the family of hawks known as buteos. It's the Latin name, B-U-T-E-O. And these birds are known for their rectangular wings and soaring capabilities, which need to heavily utilize thermals to get altitude. Some of our most familiar resident hawk species are a member of this family. Some year-round residents, some which will be leaving our area. Most common of which being the red-tailed hawk, one of our most common raptors all across North America, and a year round resident in many of our areas. So we have to be careful not to count too many of them as migrants because we know that some of them will be staying the winter. Now, as their name suggests, they're named after a very diagnostic field mark being their brick, brick colored red tail, but they don't always have that. When they're one year old, when they're in juvenile plumage, they have a brown tail. So if we see one perched, we could sometimes see a brown tail on that bird. But when we're seeing them soar overhead, oftentimes we won't even be able to see the tail at all. We're just seeing those chunky rectangular wings, which will be held out very straightforward in a soaring position. One field mark that you can see at any age group, even at long distances away, is actually right in the middle of their chest. If you look straight in the middle of their chest, you can see a whole lot of streaks in the direct center of the bird's belly with light above and below. We tend to call that the belly band because it consists of the area right in the middle of the bird, kind of like a Charlie Brown t-shirt zigzag. Sometimes we may not even be able to see that though. So we have to utilize just its silhouette and even some behaviors that the birds may be utilizing. One of which is one that we won't see in any other species in the Northeast United States. If a red-tailed hawk is soaring and looking below it over a field, sometimes seeing mice or small rodents running through fields that we would never be able to see with our eyes. They'll stop in midair, hold out their wings and go into a position known as kiting. Which you can see from this video of a red-tailed hawk hunting over Governor's Island in New York City. It's able to stop itself, hold its wings out and remain motionless in midair. If you see a hawk soaring and you just see the silhouette but you see it do that, you know in our region, you're looking at a red-tailed hawk. 
They do have smaller cousins that are getting more common in our region. An increasingly common species and increasing migrant is its smaller cousin, the red-shouldered hawk. Typically more common in the southern United States, working its way northward. The species we'll see migrating in the later half of the season in October and November. When you see them perched, they have beautiful rusty orange chests and bars on their wings, which give them their name. But in flight, we see a similar shape to red tail hawks. But here's where we have to start noticing more subtle differences. We think of those big chunky rectangle wings of a red tailed hawk, but on a red shoulder, their wings look noticeably thinner when they soar, almost like someone took a red tailed hawk's wings and filed them out at the bottom. It kind of makes it look like they're holding their wings out and reaching forward a bit more. And because of that, it also makes their tail look a bit longer than a red tailed would. One other interesting diagnostic mark that you can see at a great distance is if you look below the bird's black wingtips, especially in the photo on the right, you can see these little crescent-like patches where the sun can reflect through the wings a bit more than the other parts of the wings because the feathers are more translucent. It'll look like these glowing C or crescent patches just inside the tips of each of their wing. So this is a species that's increasing because they eat a variety of different food. They like a variety of different habitats. Right now in September, however, all eyes are on probably the biggest star of the Northeast hawk watch season. That's the smallest member of the Budio family in our region, the broad-winged hawk. These are only about the size of a crow, breed more predominantly in the Northern US and Canada because they like very remote regions to live in. And with their diet of snakes, lizards, and frogs, will need to leave our continent entirely to head to the rainforests of South America for the winter. And to stage such a big journey, they need to do it quickly in a brief window of time in September to get out of here quickly and also do it in large numbers. This is one of the only species that we'll see migrating in our region in large groups of hundreds, if not occasionally thousands. Similar to a red-tailed hawk in a soar, but instead of the more blocky squared off tip of their wing, they have more of a rounded, pinched in edge of their wing that kind of looks like a candle's flame. When you can see the details on their tail, you can also see in the adult stage, a more black and white banded tail with those distinct white bands. With their small size, they also make tighter circles than red-tailed hawks do. But at this time of year, the best way to know that you're looking at broad-winged hawks is the amount of them you see at once. Because these are the birds that right now, in the middle of September, we're awaiting days where with northwest winds, we can see thousands of these birds in a single day swirling in kettles of hundreds, if not thousands at a time. And if you get to a hawk watch on the right day during this time frame, you may even get a sight like this. It's a kid coming! It keeps coming oh, below them! You got a second more than 263 there, my friend. Right <laughs> 263 was what? This is over a, th this is over a thousand birds right here. Oh my God, wow, wow. That is at oh our God. hawk watch in biggest, September of 2018 on a day where we counted 6,000 broadwing hawks migrating past our site. And on those days where you get the perfect storm of weather conditions, you may see even more than that. On two occasions, Quaker Ridge has had record days of over 30,000 broadwing hawks counted in a single day from this site. Maybe wondering how do we possibly count that many birds and how is it possible to count them when they're swirling in those thermals. And it is difficult to count them when they're in that state when they leave those thermals though, they start gliding out in one direction, in what we call a stream of hawks and at that point we'll utilize little metal sports clickers and start clicking off the birds, maybe one at a time or 10 at a time sectioning them into groups to get an accurate number. Now hawk migration is really a parade where after these birds leave, after certain species leave, then others follow. After the broadwings leave, then you have the species of hawks that are following the small birds in migration. And one of the main families of bird hunting hawks are our accipiters, which include our sharp shinned and cooper's hawks, as well as the more northern, northern goshawk. And these species, unlike budios that are more designed for soaring, are designed for quickly chasing birds through forests and thickets and trees with stubbier, more rounded wings and long tails, which effectively help them as their steering wheel to cut through trees really quickly. The smallest of which, probably our most common accipiter migrant, which we'll see a lot more of in October, the only, the size of a blue jay, our sharp shin hawk, 
a stubby little rounded wings that often look like they have a little shoulder hunch forward, which makes their tiny little head almost look like it's not even there at all. If you see the silhouette of them, they just kind of look like a flying T. And they'll also make very snappy, quick wing beats when they propel them forward, using what looks like wrists, going flat, 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 glide, flat, 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 glide. Their slightly bigger cousin, the Cooper's hawk, is our more common breeding occipiter species in the region. Similar in color, but because of their slightly larger size, their head sticks out a bit more from their body. So that instead of a mallet shape, you get more of a flying cross shape. Their edge of their wing in the front by their shoulder often looks a lot more straight too, which is another reason their head sticks out a lot more. They often flap a bit stiffer as well, like they're using their whole wing instead of the quick snappy wing beats of a sharp shin hawk. Their more northern cousin, the largest of the occipiters, the northern goshawk, will occasionally be seen at our hawk watch sites in late October or early November when some of these young birds might be coming down from more northern regions in search of food. But this is a species that has largely been continuing to retreat into the northern United States as they've lost a lot of their food resources here, such as rough grouse and snowshoe hare. When we see one of these birds, they'll often look very chunky, like a, what we like to describe sometimes as a Cooper's hawk bodybuilder, somewhat of a blend of budio and occipiter characteristics with somewhat more rounded wings than a budio, but the chunky body that a budio might have. They aren't the only raptors that are catching birds as their specialty, but some of them are catching these birds midair and they need the kind of wings to do that. So our falcon family is designed with pointed wings like fighter jets when we see them in a silhouette so that they can swoop and catch their food in midair, whether it's birds or even insects which our smallest falcon is a specialist at, the American kestrel, which likes to hunt insects such as dragonflies and crickets and grasshoppers, also one of a species that is in very concerning decline because of loss of their habitats. There are a lot of conservation efforts are focused on them. When we see them flying, just like they're the similar size of a sharp shin hawk, we're looking for a very dainty, fluttery flight their wings often look like banana or boomerang wing, as we like to call them, with more rusty colored tails. The males and females also differ in plumage, unlike a lot of other birds of prey where the males and females look the same, but the only difference is size. In birds of prey, females are larger than the males. Their slightly darker cousin, the merlin, is more thick and chunky and has a more determined and quick flight. We like to say at a hawk watch sometimes, if we see a merlin, it's just like, oh, there goes a and then it's gone. So they're more slate gray, dark gray or bluish on the back with a black and white banded tail as opposed to a rusty tail. And you're gonna hear more about this species in just a little bit. When we think of falcons, however, we'll often turn our minds to their larger cousin, the peregrine falcon, species that we nearly lost several decades ago due to them being wiped out along with many other of our bird species because of DDT. Many of you will famously know that many of our raptor species were nearly brought to extinction because of these pesticides, because their eggshells would be too thin to hatch after eating contaminated birds and other sources of food. But thankfully, thanks to the banning of DDT and reintroduction of these birds, this is a species that we see in great numbers once again. They prefer coastal hawk watch sites because falcons can power themselves on their own flight without having to use thermals. So we don't see too many peregrines from our hawk watch site, although I did hear we actually had our first two of the season today at Quaker Ridge. When you see them flying overhead and they're in a soar, it will often look like a cocked bow and arrow shape with those two pointed wings splayed out like a bow. Now it's not just the raptor species that are catching and killing their prey that we're seeing flying over our hawk watch site. There are a couple of scavengers, members of our vulture family, mother nature's garbage people. Turkey vultures have become one of the most familiar sites at a hawk watch and are often very easy to tell apart from other species because of their large dark size and the way that they hold their wings up in the shape of the letter that vulture starts with, V. The shape of a V, which some of these birds will hold their wings up in, we refer to as a dihedral, and they will rock back and forth, teeter-tottering in the wind to brace themselves and look down below them to look, search for carrion. And they also have had their more southern cousin join them in the region in the past 20 years. The black vulture has become a species that normally was more common farther south, but unfortunately due to climate change and more suitable habitats for them now up north, 
they are now a year round resident and often can be easily distinguished from a turkey vulture in flight because of their stubbier wings, silver wing tips, and a very short stubby tail. They aren't the only large dark birds, however, and oftentimes we'll see one that comes over that looks like two giant rectangular planks for wings and large dark chunky size being our bald eagle. Of course, the adults being unmistakable with their white head and tail, but many people don't know that it takes about four to five years for a bald eagle to go for, to its full adult plumage. They're chocolate brown when they're a juvenile bird. And when they open their wings and we see them in flight, if you look at the top right photo, they'll have these long white lines on their wings like chocolate and vanilla ice cream, creating this modeling coloration. Last year, we had a couple of very unique days where we actually had a record day of over 30 bald eagles in one day. Not something we would have had about 50 years ago. On average now, we get about 200 bald eagles a season at our hawk watch, thanks to the reintroduction efforts of these birds. A much rarer sight and one that's always very exciting in the later half of the season is the golden eagle, which we'll see several of, if not maybe a dozen or so each year. A more common species out west, but there are small breeding populations in Northeast Canada, like Quebec and the Labrador provinces. It is often young birds that come into our region because they'll get blown here by really strong cold north winds. Unlike those white lines on a bald eagle, we see two round white patches, one on each side of their wing and a white tail with a big black terminal band on the end. Other large bird that eats fish just like our bald eagles that we'll see in large numbers, especially now during this first half of the migration season is our osprey. Also one of our neotropical migrants as they'll also be going to South America for the winter. Their long bowed wings will give them away even at a very long distance, creating a letter M shape with their wings. They'll utilize some of the same thermals as broadwing hawks will do. So we'll even see them and often looking much larger than the smaller broad wings around them using the same kettles. And not only have we learned a lot about them from hawk watches, but we've learned a lot of new research about these birds through the work of radio transmitters. Rob Beregard, who's a friend of ours and lifelong osprey researcher, has created an incredible website called ospreytracks.com, where you can go see the migration routes that many of these birds have taken. One other species in a family of its own that we count in our region and a species of particular concern is our northern harrier which has other relatives in other parts of the world, but they are the only member of this family in North America. Sort of an amalgamation of some of the other raptor families with similar features, like a long tail like an occipiter, very long bowed wings that they'll hold up in a V like a turkey vulture, a very sleek slender shape, and a big white rump patch at the upper part of their tail. The males and females will also look very different. Just like the kestrels, they'll have different plumages. Females are more brownish with streaks, Males are a beautiful silvery blue, and we'll often refer to them as a gray ghost when they fly. They'll have very slow, graceful wing flaps, not quick or snappy like any of the occipiters will. This has been probably one of our most concerning species at hawk watches, as we've seen numbers of this bird go into steep decline, largely due to loss of their open meadow habitats and salt marshes, which are rising due to climate change. So the purpose of looking for and counting all of these birds is to ensure that we are understanding what is affecting their ecosystems. And just by helping at a hawk watch and counting them, you are doing your part to help understand this information. But there are other things we can do. If we know that these birds are in peril, we have to work to preserve these spaces that, are, that have become so vulnerable in these, this changing environment we have. We can plant native plants that'll help encourage their prey sources like insects, and birds, and small rodents that can run underneath them. As I mentioned with DDT, um, there are always certain dangerous factors that might wind up in their environment and rodenticides are still a major problem that are poisoning birds of prey wherever they might be used. So we strongly discourage the use of any rodenticides and poisons when you have the best natural resource to do that for you right outside your door. We can also help to stay in communication with the people who are doing this work on other countries and other continents where these birds are going. Once these hawks leave our region, they have to venture through Central and South America where hawk watchers in Veracruz are counting millions of raptors. Our friends in Panama are counting birds outside of Panama City. And one day they counted 2 million raptors in a single day at their Ancon Hill hawk watch site and had to shut down the international airport. 
Now, even in South America, countries like Colombia are not only starting to get research on raptors, but also just as Rosalie Edge did nearly a century ago, getting research on how we can help stop harm and shooting of these birds. And there is even more incredible new information being compiled as we speak. For the first time this year, we've had broadwing hawks being radio tagged here in the state of Connecticut. Hawk Mountain has taken the incredible initiative to start radio tagging broadwing hawks across the Northeast, starting in Pennsylvania. But now with birds being tagged in Connecticut, we can see where some of the birds in our backyard are heading now in migration. So in closing, just want to mention a couple tips and things that you can get to help you to learn how to hawk watch better. There are some incredible books that have come out, starting with Hawks in Flight, which was the original Bible of sorts to help you understand bird shapes and silhouettes. Jerry Liguri has now published several incredible books since then with even more in-depth information and has now also collaborated on the Crossley ID Guide to Raptors, which has incredible photos photoshopped in different areas to quiz yourself on these different shapes and silhouettes. And the resources you can use are phenomenal in helping you to understand where to go and how you can find this information. We submit all of our numbers at our Hawk Watch site to hawkcount.org, which is Humana, the Hawk Migration Association of North America's website, where you can see the numbers from all of the Hawk Watches across the country. And now you can even see them live as we're able to submit them via apps and online databases that can sync to it. You can even go on to hawkcount.org right now and see what Quaker Ridge has had today as we post it live. The best thing to do is get out to a hawk watch near you. Aside from Quaker Ridge, if you live in Connecticut, the other major hawk watch site in the state is Lighthouse Point in New Haven, Connecticut, a more coastal site, which sees more falcons than we do. So, and if you live in New York, just 10 miles north of us, Bedford Audubon staffs Chestnut Ridge in Mount Kisco, New York, and several other hawk watches across New York State. But it's not just the fall that we see hawk migration occurring. These birds return every spring, and they will head to regions where they're going to meet boundaries when they're heading northward. In New York in particular, it's extremely fortunate that we have several hawk watches along the southern shore of Lake Ontario that are able to gather this information in the spring. And we are very grateful to have one of those individuals who is the president of Braddock Bay Raptor Research on with us right now to talk to you a bit more about Braddock Bay, Hawk Watch that you can visit in the springtime and to share with you one of their very special feathered friends. So I would like to welcome now Dana Ford of Braddock Bay Raptor Research with a very special guest. Well, thank you very much, Ryan. It's a pleasure to be here and be a part of this webinar again this year. Hawk watching, of course, is my favorite subject to talk about and activity to do. Um, right now, I have to wait. I have to go find a fall site. So it's great that you posted a list of those. Because um, we're here from Braddock Bay, New York, which is just a little bit northwest of Rochester. Um, and we're a spring site. Why are we a spring site? Because we're located on the southern shore of Lake Ontario. So as the birds are heading back north to their breeding ground on a mission to get to those breeding territories, they are come, um, come up against the Great Lakes. And as you heard from Ryan, these birds rely on help from the environment like thermals and updrafts. Um, and so they're following the shoreline of Lake Ontario, riding thermals, instinctively knowing not to cross that cold water. Um, and so because where we are situated in Braddock Bay, we create a funneling spot. Where we see up to 50,000 plus raptors every spring season. So it's a very, very exciting time of year. Um, Braddock Bay hawk counts have been going on for over four decades, and um, we hire a counter every season. We were lucky enough to have Brian as um, our counter back in 2016, uh, but we have many, many volunteers who also help um, with the count and other aspects of our organization. Uh, if you're looking to come out in the spring, it's a very accessible um, site to get to. We're located in a town park on state and public land, so it's very accessible, and it even stayed open during the pandemic time. So um, we're, we're always welcome, ready to welcome visitors to the site there. Um, and if you can't make it in the spring and you're a local to the area or you want to take a day trip, um, it's a great place to bird any time of year. And um, 
all year round. We can get wintering birds, we get shorebirds now, we get songbirds, all kinds of, of great places to, to visit. So I encourage everyone to get out. If you can't come to Braddock, to, then to a Hawkwatch site near you. I've also got, as you can see, a, a feathered guest joining me today and, you know, perfect uh, example of a raptor and hopefully you're taking her in and, and, and being in, enthralled with her beauty. Um, this is a merlin, not a bird that you see all the time out there. It's not a very common bird in most of our region in the Northeast, but uh, a one that is starting to show up more and more, you know, whether it's migration or even breeding and wintering birds too. Our merlin is one of our uh, four birds that are part of our education team. She is non-releasable because she has a permanent wing injury. So I'm showing her you her good side, so to speak, and that true falcon form. They are built for speed with that kind of bullet-shaped body. And as you heard about the, a little bit more about their identification, they have the long tapered pointy wings that are meant to cut through the air, give them very swift flight, they have very long tails to help them maneuver um, and be such a successful aerial hunter. She has a shorter uh, left wing. Unfortunately, she suffered an injury that injured her wing so badly they had to remove part of it. So she's got a shorter wing, which prevents her, unfortunately, from flying. But now she's in our care and she's been a great ambassador, ambassador for her species and other raptors alike. Um, as we travel around to the community and actually go out virtually now, as you're seeing, to um, let people get a little closer look at these magnificent birds. They are small but mighty. And I think uh, Ryan alluded to a little bit of their attitude out there. They don't like anyone in their airspace. So um, they're a very bold raptor. And we often see them harassing other larger raptors who do get in their airspace. They're, they're not afraid to chase, chase others away. So a little package with a lot of attitude, and I think that's what um, is a testament to their success in nature. As I kind of mentioned earlier, they are a species that is being seen more and more in our area. They are one of those species that is on the rise in terms of the entire population. They did suffer declines similar to bald eagles and peregrine falcons and ospreys you know, back when DDT was a problem and habitat loss as well. So it's good to see um, these birds coming back a little bit from the brink and you know, hawk watching and hawk watch sites, monitoring sites like ours and all the other fall sites, Baker Ridge, um, play a significant role in monitoring these raptor populations. So we can assess the trends and see what's happening out there if their numbers are doing well or if they're um, declining or even stable. Some, some raptors are doing just fine. So um, it's a great tool to have um, hawk watchers out there doing that job and as one way to assess the population. So um, I should mention too, you know, we, we didn't talk too much about um, the differences in males and females. She is a female. And in the world of raptors, generally speaking, well, girls are bigger than the boys. So that's one way we know, but Merlins are a species that do have dimorphism in terms of coloring. So female Merlins are more brown on the, and grayish on the wings and in the tail bands where the male would be, be more blue on the back and have some blue in the tail as well. So that is one way we know this is definitely a female. Um, so Merlins are just there, you get a little view of her uh, wing shape there. She takes a little flap. Um, Merlins, like I said, I mentioned, are a special bird to see no matter where, um, but not a common one. So every sighting is special. Often, hawk watches are a great place to go to see those birds that you can't see um, on the breeding seat in the breeding season when they're more secretive. So going to a hawk watch gets you to, to see multiple species at once and special ones like this. Often Merlins are the first bird of the day and sometimes the last bird of the day because they kind of spread out their hunting and their activity level. And um, you know they have such a high metabolism, they're going to feed um, almost sometimes multiple times throughout the day. They're very high energy birds. So a good place to go to find species like this, definitely some hawk watch sites. 
So we're, we're fortunate to have a bird like this in our education team so that visitors and people that we share these birds with get to see them up close. Um, and they provide an educational avenue just like hawk watches do. So hawk watches are, um, of course, dual purpose. They are a great way to collect scientific information that helps in the conservation of many species across the continent. And they also have that education component where it's a great place to come out and learn your birds um, in one spot and have multiple people helping you um, spot things and learn the, the subtleties of identification. And then it opens up even more um, things to see out there in nature once you start paying attention. So it's been, it's a, a great activity to get into and I hope to see lots of you up at Braddock in the spring. And I hope that you get out to a fall site near you before, it's, before the season's over. Well, hello, thank you. I'm sorry I got on so late there. I was writing down a question here. We're about to start a question and answer, but that was a wonderful presentation. It was just so timely because, you know, being right in the middle of fall migration right now, I'm pretty sure. Um, everyone on the call probably wants to get outside so they can look up in the sky and see, see some of that majesty. But um, we do have time for some question and answers. Uh, um, if, you, if you have any question, um, please put it in the chat. We'll try to get to as many as we can uh, before the hour ends. And uh, I'll start. I have a question right now um, from Barbara. She asked, will the migrants try to get food if they're held up by bad weather? Oh, I saw that come in earlier, if you want me to take that out. I'm, I'm very interested in, in answering that question. Yes, they definitely will hunt uh, during this journey they need, and need places to stop and fuel up and catch a meal. So often in inclement weather, when we get storms, whether it's snow or, or rain or, or um, likewise, they're going to take advantage of that opportunity to hunker down. Um, but even when we don't have storm coming through. Often some of these birds will get up in the morning. First thing they'll do before they head out on their long journey is do a little hunting. And we see that on our hawk watch site. I'm sure you can encounter that a little at Quaker Ridge too. Um, so, and even some of these birds like the falcons will be hunting on the wing and we've seen them catching dragonflies and beetles and things right in the air. So they will definitely feed during migration. Great. Uh, another question from Lucia. Um, what do birds get caught for banding? I know that we were talking about banding a little bit earlier. Um, yes, how's that done? I'm going to take that one too, Brian. Uh, okay. Uh, sure, because uh, you do have a wonderful banding station at Braddock Bay. Sure. Um, yeah, I can answer that. That's one of the other projects that we do at Braddock Bay is we have a, a banding. Uh, program. So we are capturing birds during the spring season as well. Um, and there's different way, methods of trapping raptors for banding. It's a little bit more of an active process than it is for songbirds, where, um, but we also will use mist nets like they do for songbirds. Um, so, but basically you need a, a, a lure to attract the bird into a trap, which could be a bow trap, um, there's a couple other different types. There's called shatri traps as well. Um, but the lure is usually a pigeon or a starling um, or maybe an audio call that would at attract a bird into the trapping station. And uh, once the bird is, is um, trapped, it is carefully removed and then handled in such a manner that the, the banders are able to take certain measurements. The band is swiftly put on the leg of the bird and off it goes back into the wild. Um, I'm not sure the exact methods. If, uh, I think that the question came up when um, the, we talked about the broad wings being banded in Connecticut and with the transmitters. So I'm not sure the exact methods they use it, but they're probably similar to what we use. And we have some information about our banding on our website too, if you'd like to learn a little bit more. Great, thank you, Dana. Um, actually, I have two questions, but they're kind of related, Ryan, so maybe you can kind of answer them in tandem. Um, Sharon asked, do these birds fly at night? I also asked from Patricia, asked, are, are owls raptors? So do, 
great questions to answer those. First, um, are owls raptors? Yes, they are. By definition, any of these birds that are capturing their prey by utilizing their sharp talons on their feet are by definition raptors. Many birds are predators. Many birds are birds of prey, that catch live prey, but they'll you do it by different means. There's a bird called a night hawk, which looks very similar to a hawk, but is actually a member of the night jar family where the whippoorwill is their cousin. And they catch their prey by opening their large mouths and catching insects. So the big difference is catching prey with their feet. And owls are part of that family because they do. Now to answer your question, do hawks migrate at night? Um, I, with, I meant, what I mentioned with thermals and what they'll need from the sun to help give them that energy for lift, that's what they want during the day to help them migrate. And they don't get that at night. So by and large, raptors will not migrate at night, which makes it easy for us to watch them during the day and have our general hawk watch hours sort of be business hours of nine to five with some little differences depending on how many are moving on a given day. There are some instances, however, of some birds um, that have had a tendency to continue migrating into the night. Ospreys in particular, I've had some instances where people have shown that because they may migrate over water, sometimes they can't stop. So they're gonna to have to keep going overnight. So more research on that needs to be done. And some people who I know have done some uh, looking into um, the movements of nocturnally migrating ospreys, but uh, that's a whole different story. But interestingly enough, some owl species do also migrate, which we won't obviously see at a hawk watch during the day. Occasionally we'll get lucky to see a migrating short-eared owl in the evening, but our Northern sawwet owls are a migratory species, the species that all of us got to know when it went viral being found in the Rockefeller Center Christmas tree last year. It's a species that they also do banding on. Braddock Bay also has an incredible owl banding program up in their region. So we're getting research on both the day shift and the night shift from these migrants. But if you want to see these hawks, it's best to go to a hawk watch during the day, generally between the hours of about 9 and 5 p.m. Great, thank you. Um, I, I know we have an audience that's uh, national, even international, but um, I know quite a bit of our participants are here from the Northeast and the Connecticut, um, New York, Pennsylvania area. Um, and I, I think some of this stuff was on your slides, uh, but maybe uh, I think we were asked, what's the best place for fall migration? Some of the best place for fall migration in the Eastern United States. You want to reiterate that, Brent? You're on mute. Sorry, everyone. So here's the slide that I have once again of our, some of just a smattering of some of the over 200 hawk watch sites that are across the country. If you go to hawkcount.org, to Hamana's website, you can find hawk watches near you and just how regularly they post their numbers. As far as New York, I mentioned just 10 miles from us, Bedford Audubon conducts the Chestnut Ridge Hawk Watch along 684 along the Hudson River. Um, Hook Mountain is another hawk watch that's been in operation for over 50 years on the Palisades where people are going to watch on the cliffs as these hawks are hitting that corridor of the waterway of the Hudson River. Um, I noticed I saw a couple people in the chat um, mentioning they were from Oneonta, not knowing about the Franklin Mountain Hawk Watch. And that is an incredible spot to go see migrating golden eagles in the later half of the season in November. Because it's much further inland along more of a ridge line, that's right on their migration route, more so than along the coast here. Uh, some days you gotta wear every layer you own and go out on a day that's snowing and 20 degrees. But in some days they've actually seen over a hundred golden eagles in a day from that site. And as far as some of the other major destination points for hawk watching in the Northeast, aside from Hawk Mountain, of course, which is still a place where thousands of visitors go every year, Cape May, New Jersey is another one of the major sites of the Northeast, especially for coastal hawk watching for birds like falcons. You see maybe a couple hundred peregrine falcons in Cape May in a day because all of these hawks are getting bottlenecked into the peninsula of having the ocean on one side, Delaware Bay on the other. So same thing as many of our other hawk watches where you need to watch the weather for days of northwest winds to know you're going to get a really good day. But going to hawkcount.org, going to the MANA website, see what hawk watches are near you, how regularly they are out and counting and posting their numbers to determine where is best and closest to you to go enjoy a hawk watch. Great. 
Um, here's a question from Joshua. He asked, do um, any of the migrating raptors stay in the region for prolonged periods? He had an example. He said uh, he's, he, in Brooklyn, he sees an American kestrel in the same area every year um, on a frequent basis from September until early December. Um, he's not sure if that's a more likely a resident or a migrating bird. There's certain species where um, you have complete migrants, like the broadwing cocks, so they're likely to be the entire population moves out of the northeast part of uh, and the eastern part of the U.S. and goes down Central and South America. But there are some migrants, like red-tailed hawks and kestrels, as you mentioned, that are partial migrants, and there are some in our region that are year-round residents. So you have some of the more northern um, individuals of that population will be the ones that travel often the furthest south and be the most migratory. Whereas in the middle of their range, we know with red tails, especially, the kind of a lot of them will stick around for the winter. So it's very possible to see some of the migrants year round, depending on where you are in the region. Great. Um, when at a hawk watch, is it distracting to ask questions at the counters? <laughs> Definitely depends on uh, the kind of day that it is. If it's a day, if you go to a hawk watch a day like today at our hawk watch site, it is uh, it is uh, easy to communicate with people more um, because there aren't as many hawks going by at once. On the really busy broadwing days, um, when the counters have clickers and you're trying to get catch all these broadwing hawks going over at any given time, it can get a bit more hectic. What I would say, however, is um, all of us, including myself, have learned hawk watching through going out to these sites and being a part of these communities. Hawk watching is such an easy way to be a part of a birding community and to make an active difference in community science. And if it wasn't for places that were welcoming, like these hawk watches, then um, we wouldn't have as many people involved and i would say and you know both dana mentioned the accessibility of their hawk watch site as well the same for here at quaker ridge where some hawk watch sites which are incredible to go to they involve hiking up a big mountain to get to and the views are phenomenal but um here at quaker ridge and at braddock bay um they are even accessible to individuals in wheelchairs and other mobility devices so that all can enjoy birding and be a part of this experience so uh, find a hawk watch near you and, you know, you want to go out and engage what's happening on a given day, but don't be afraid to ask questions and the people that are at these sites, especially including volunteers who are also there helping out and calling birds out. We're always welcoming new people to come and be a part of the experience because even if you don't know what you're looking at at first or just learning the species just pointing the birds out and spotting them is enough to start getting your enthusiasm going and helping us to count these birds too, because it takes a whole bunch of eyes to get all of them as they're coming through on those busy days. Great. Well, we only have time for about one more question, um, but if anyone, we didn't get to your question and you have a burning one that you want to ask, um, I'll put in the chat um, the email addresses for Audubon New York and Audubon Connecticut, and uh, we'll have Ryan or, or Dana will respond afterwards for you. So um, the last question is this, and it's kind of another two-parter. What is the best time of day to watch for fall hawk migrations? And and uh, and then Jocelyn asks: is, is migrations is hawk migration more dense on warm, warmer, or cooler days? So, oh, Dana, I'm sorry. Were you going to take that? No, this is yours. <laughs> okay. Um, so we the question of what the best time of day is. Um, there's two ways of answering that one for from the birds perspective and the other from ours they need that sunlight to give them the lift that they need to migrate in which generally between like nine to five when the sun is heating the ground up enough for them to want to keep moving but during the middle of the day it can be very difficult to see a lot of birds because they can be at very high altitude they may still be up there but they may just be specks for us to get the best looks at a lot of these birds, usually the most enjoyable looks at birds at a hawk watch are when they're starting to gain altitude for the day and when they're coming down at the end of the day. So I generally like to tell people that between nine and 11 in the morning and then about three to five in the afternoon is when you're gonna start getting lower looks at these birds because they're either going up for the day or coming down 
for the day. And to answer the question about the best conditions for whether warmer or cooler weather is generally good for fall migration, as I mentioned earlier in the program, when cold fronts pass through and you have northerly winds behind them, that generally provides better conditions for us to observe them. But it's the opposite in the spring. So I'll let Dana describe, if you go to Braddock Bay in the spring, what you're gonna to wanna to be looking for then. Yes, yeah, so it's definitely kind of the opposite at Braddock Bay. Um, and from any, most of the spring sites, you know, we're, we're looking for more southerly winds to push birds our way. And, and, and at Braddock Bay, Southwest is best. Um, and we need, and because of where we are on Lake Ontario and the, it has its own kind of microclimate too. Um, we need a good, decent southwest wind. Between 20, 10 and 20 miles per hour is usually good. And if it's anything less than that, sometimes we get lake breeze to take over. And there's a northerly wind that comes off the cold lake and pushes the birds away from us. So yes, we need south southerly winds and we actually need more warming temperatures. When we start off in bundled up in March in the freezing cold, and then by the end of May, hopefully we are in shorts and sandals, but um, so it's kind of the opposite. But, and in terms of day, you know, time of day, I think you're kind of pretty good as far as the best views. Um, and it really kind of depends on what the weather is doing too. So it can be very exciting on days when you have a front moving through because um, birds will travel ahead and um, behind the fronts. So it can be really exciting on those days when you get some passing storms, thunderstorms, and that kind of thing. Great, well, thank you. Thank you, Ryan, thanks, Dana, and thanks everyone for joining us. That's all the time that we have today. Um, we'll, uh, we hope you'll join us for our next webinar, it'll be on October 20th, and Gloria, Gloria Lentillo will present on bird conservation and ecotourism in tropical Colombia. And thanks again, and thanks to that beautiful Merlin for joining us. <laughs>